Get Gutsy, episode number 180 with Amy Ehlers. Are you too hard on yourself? Welcome to Get Gutsy. I'm your host, Jenny Fennig, and I am so excited to be on this journey with you. A cutting-edge show blending business and spirituality, Get Gutsy serves up a potent blend of stories, lessons, and tips to help you make a massive impact in the world through your soul's work and your inspired life. No more going it alone. No more excuses. The world needs more brave women saying yes to leadership. Are you with me? Good. Let's get gutsy now. Hey there. See, goodness, when this episode goes live, I will just be returning to my office after a, a long winter's nap. I called it <laughs> when I was creating. I was like, I'm going to take a long winter's nap. Wow. And uh, I'll be sure to update you next week on just how it was and um, the results from my social media sabbatical. I always like to run these experiments, so I was running that really as an experiment and just, yeah, where my heart and head is as I move into 2018. I'm actually creating this intro at the end of 2017 because I'm going to be heading off on a vacay beginning of January and I just want to honor that and get as much done prior to leaving as I can. My daughter's about to, I think, maybe blaze in here with her new... um, Sophia the first boom box, which is no, no, hold on. And I'm just keeping it real. Here you go, ladies. Okay. She loves Sophia the first and she got a Sophia the first boom box for Christmas and she rocks that boom box. It's so cute. It looks like a purse <laughs> and it has a microphone attached to it, which is pretty much how Kate rolls a purse with a microphone. And she rocks Sophia, and there's some really good songs, like that you can do anything, you can be anything. So I'm kind of singing that song too. But anyway, I wanted to create this intro for you uh, because I have a great guest. First time Amy Ehlers has been on the show, and she's just a joy and a gem, and she's become a great friend of mine, and I'm pumped to feature her on the podcast today. Um, the theme is, are you too hard on yourself? And my son's just walking into, I'll talk to you in a moment, keeping it real kids. Cause this is like hashtag real life, hashtag. You just got to keep rolling. Okay. My son is walking in with his new, um, I don't even know what that thing is called. It's a drone. It's a drone, which he got for Christmas and He's plugging it in. <laughs> Normally I'm in my office, but I didn't feel like being in my office because I'm like off. <laughs> you know what I mean? When you're like off, you're like, I can't be in my office. So I'm working in the, um, we have this library room in the house. And so I'm, I'm in here and my kids are just part of this because that's just what it is sometimes. I feel like that's a piece of my 2018 energy is living a more integrated existence, really integrating things. And, you know, one way that I'm doing it, and then I'm going to tell you more about Amy and what we're talking about today, um, is I got like a new calendaring, like a a physical, like writing in it calendar for 2018. And I homeschool my boys and I was keeping everything separate, like their homeschooling calendar over here. And then like my work stuff over here. And then of course I had my digital calendar, which I still love. But I was feeling the desire for a physical written calendar. And I wanted to mix everything. Like I Yeah. I want everything to be in one versus like all separate because when it was separate, I just didn't feel integrated. I didn't feel like things were as connected as I want them to be and as they really are. Like that's just real. And so that's that's a piece that I'm bringing to it. So anyway. As I created this intro and my daughter was cruising in, then my son, I'm like, this is an integrated life, y'all. Because I think, you know, many women especially believe like, well, I can't get going because I have kids who walk in and out. Or I have this other thing going on or that other thing going on. And it's like, that is just what it is. And you got to begin anyway and just trust that those people who are called to work with you or learn from you, they're cool with that. And those who are going to be offended by the fact that you have other things going on besides your work, in addition to your work, then they're not your people. 
Okay, so let me tell you about Amy. She's awesome. She is like an OG in the coaching world. I didn't realize how far back her coaching background went until we chatted and I had her on the show. She has um, just been here for a while. She started as um, an actress. I didn't know that. That was pretty cool. And um, yeah, she studied acting in school. My son Luke just walked in. So all three have walked in during the course of this intro, which just goes to show what our winter break has been like, um, which has been awesome and just fabulous. And um, anyway, Amy, yes, she went to school for drama and, you know, pursued that for a bit and then found her way into coaching. So you're going to hear about how she made her way into this wild and wonderful industry. Um, oh, man. <laughs> going to go to a different section because they're starting to get loud. Um, my son started playing the piano. Now they're building with blocks, which is awesome. What is your life like? I want to know. Tell me. Okay. So um, Amy has really developed an expertise in what she calls the inner mean girl. You're going to hear what that is and how to know what yours is and you know what she sounds like and all that kind of stuff. When you tune in today, you're going to really grasp what you can do to truly step into your path if it's a coach or any other field that you feel called to be in. But, you know, when you hear about Amy's approach, you'll really understand what she had to do to get this baby off the ground. And then she gets honest about her, her road as a mother and, you know, the process that she went through to birth number two, um, and not even birth number two, but to get pregnant with number two. It's just really cool. I like having these conversations because they're, you know, for us moms, I am one myself, it's good to discuss just what is, just like what happens. And, you know, if we want to have more kids, like how to create space for that in our work. It doesn't just like ha happen necessarily. For some it does, like the babies just come right in. But for others, we have to like consciously make space, um, let go of some things, simplify, um, say no to certain opportunities that we would have said yes to, you know, if we weren't kind of bringing in this, this spirit or this soul. Anyway, um, we get deep on that and I really enjoyed uh, that conversation with Amy and I, I hope you will too. Uh, the big theme of this episode is are you too hard on yourself? And so if you are, <laughs> you're definitely going to want to tune in. And if you have somebody in your life who you know like she's really hard on herself and she just needs to like be kinder, um, definitely forward this episode on, share it with your crew. Yeah, it's just... I've been too hard on myself um, for a lot of my life, and I've learned. I've learned to really re-examine that and um, have a new way of speaking to myself of love and kindness and grace and unconditional love, really, unconditional love. That has been a, a big a big theme and, and something that I've needed to embrace, and I know that you're going to get a ton of value from this conversation with Miss Amy Ehlers. Enjoy it, and I'll see you next week. Of course. All right, Amy, we doing this thing. Welcome to Get Gutsy. <sighs> Woo, baby. Yeah, I know, right? And what a time when women are getting gutsy. Thank that is Lord. right. That is right. That is right. And on the day that we are recording this, Time Magazine has published their annual issue, Person of the Year. I was kind of waiting on pins and needles, <laughs> like, where, where, are they, where are they taking this? You know, where are they taking this? Yep. And they took it in an extraordinary direction. Person of the year, the silence breakers. And you see these images of mostly women, but they're featuring some really cool guys in this issue too. The patriarchy is crumbling. And <laughs> as women, we are rising up saying, our voices matter, we are being believed. And now is the freaking time. So how did you feel when you saw that issue in your face? Oh my goodness. Well, I so emotional mm -hmm. as I'm, I think that most women felt for so long, we have been bullied. We have been pushed down. We've been not believed. We've been told that we're crazy. 
we've been, you know, just put through the ringer when we rise up and speak our truth. We've been literally burned at the stake, for goodness sake, if you look at historically, right? And of course, we still have such a long road ahead of us. Lord knows that. Mm -hmm. But for this to be celebrated Mm -hmm. in this way is a moment in history and a moment in time when I feel like we as women, I'm getting chills as I'm saying this, but when we as women can be um, acknowledged for the gutsiness, for the bravery, for the courage that it takes to speak out and speak our truth and speak the truth. Yes. Oh my gosh. Speak the truth. And, you know, as you were speaking those words, you're such a great speaker, by the way, but Mm -hmm. just realizing, yes, there there was a time that we were burned out of the stake. I was doing a Facebook live earlier today and I was just like, what's happening right now, like in the past, we would have been killed for this and now we're being freaking celebrated. Now it's like (laughs) the tides have turned. This is the moment we've been waiting for. This is what the generations who came before us fought for, died for you know, dreamed about, hoped for, wondered, will it ever happen? And they were willing to get out there and do it because they trusted that there was a better way. And now we're here. And yes, there's still a lot more work to do. But, you know, in your work as a coach and and my work as a coach, I mean, don't you just feel like, I mean, I I say to my people, I'm like, there's never been a better time to (laughs) do this work. I mean, this is, this is it. How are you feeling in terms of its connection to the work that you do and the message that you have for your people? Well, you know, so much of my work is about helping women wake up to their inner wisdom voice, that voice of truth inside of you, that voice that unconditionally loves you, has endless compassion for you, that voice that tells you the truth. It's the ultimate truth teller. So a lot of times people think of their inner wisdom and they think, oh, my inner wisdom is just going to be like, you're beautiful. You're amazing. And yes, she definitely does do that. Thank the Lord. Mm -hmm. And she'll also be like, put the cookie down. You know, she'll be like, put the drink down, honey, or get out of that marriage or get Mm -hmm. out of that job or Mm -hmm. say no or speak up and tell the truth. Don't let that person get away with that, right? She Mm -hmm. is the ultimate truth teller. She's a badass Mm -hmm. for inner wisdom. So that's really the center of my work. So to have it be so celebrated right now Mm -hmm. is just, I mean, my gosh. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in order for us to really connect with our inner wisdom, we have to move aside the voice of the inner critic, which I call the inner mean girl. Mm -hmm. The meanest one of the ball is not the one in the hallways at junior high and is not the one at the, you know, at the PTA meeting (laughs) with your kids that's looking down on you or the one in the boardroom that's rolling her eyes at you. The meanest girl of them all is the one inside our head. You know, it's interesting, um, Jenny, because I just am in the midst right now of doing a survey for Mm -hmm. women on Mm self-bullying. And I've had over 533 women respond to the survey, totally anonymous. Mm -hmm. And it is so fascinating to see how freaking hard we are on ourselves Mm -hmm. and how much we beat ourselves down, how much we're keeping ourselves down. Mm -hmm. And so that's really the core and the crux of my work, which I've been doing you know, I became a coach back in 2000. So I've been doing this work for 18 years. It's, of course, gone through many different phases and evolutions over time. But really, for me, it's about how hard we are on ourselves as women and tuning into that voice of truth. So this is like the glory days for me right now to have women celebrated that have shared their truth and spoken up and been gutsy enough and courageous enough. My gosh. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. I feel that so deeply. And I love that you've been connected to this work for such a long time. I mean, we're, we're recording this at the end of 2017. So it's like 17 years you've been in this space. Well, I want to get a better understanding of how you got here. And the way that I like to do this with my guests is to talk more about you know, younger you, not that we're all not so young and fabulous, but you know, <laughs> we have some more, some more years that have joined us on this journey. But yeah. I like to go back to your childhood, you know, when you were little Amy, like that, I say pre-18, pre-18 yeah. time, because I have found, and then I essentially follow my own curiosity around this, that our work is so connected to, you know, what we were fascinated by when we were children or what hard stuff we dealt with when we were children. Mm-hmm. And then we just weave this thread and it keeps coming with us all the way to the finish line when we, you know, say our, say our goodbyes at the end of this long, glorious life. So let's go back to that time. And I'd love for you to tell us about, tell me about uh, 
some, some favorite memory from, you know, that, that childhood of yours, like, there's something that you look back like, that was so amazing. I loved that. It could be like one particular thing. It could be just like, you know, something that played a big role for a long period of time during that, that section of your life. So fascinating because I am so fortunate in that I had a very happy childhood. Mm -hmm. It still was incredibly difficult just being a human being on this planet, but I so recognize Mm -hmm. being raised as a, you know, a privileged white woman in a family where my parents were still together and they still are together. They're married now. They've been married now for 47 years. They still hold hands. Uh They're best friends. So I grew up in a household where that was happening. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up with my, my big sister, Laura, who is still one of my best friends and who I love and adore and respect and who love and adores and respects me. We're incredibly different. She's Mm. a badass corporate executive and she thinks it's like fascinating that I've published books and I'm a life coach and she yeah. loves that about me, you know, uh-huh. and I love that about her, that she's in that world and just, you know, really trailblazing in that world as mm-hmm. a women ex- executive. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm very, very, very deeply fortunate and I know that. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, even when we're raised in those environments where people are getting along and where there's a lot of love and where you feel loved and where we weren't ever, you know, I've never, I did not grow up in a household where I was worried where my next meal was going to be. Right. We certainly didn't, we're not rich, but right. you know, we had stability around right. those things. Right. And, um, you know, and still uh, there's, there's times, you know, I was thinking, um, I think especially because I'm a mom and I have two mm-hmm. little girls myself and, mm-hmm. and I know you know as a mom mm-hmm. as well, mm-hmm. when we raise mm-hmm. our kids then we're seeing ourselves and those kids and my oldest daughter, Annabella, is 10 years old. She's in fifth grade. She is full on in it. She's going to be going to middle school next year. And for me, mm-hmm. middle school was the most traumatizing time of my life. Mm. Um, Annabelle and I've been talking about that because she's definitely had some girl drama that mm-hmm. has been coming mm-hmm. up and the whole, you're not my friend, you are my friend. Um, you know, I definitely had that period of time in seventh grade where my, nobody would talk to me, where my friends just decided that they weren't going to speak to me and wow. where I just felt so deeply alone and mm-hmm. all of those overt aggressions and then microaggressions of being a girl in Mm -hmm. girl culture. And I think that that, especially with social media has gotten even more amplified for our kids. Mm. Oh my. That's what I say. I'm like, I am really glad I didn't grow up in the time of the technology that we have now, because like you, it was hard enough growing up back then when people could just pass notes and, you know, you know, maybe have like three-way phone calls and like someone's on the other end, you're like, what? You know, are there yeah. rumors that were spread about you? Like on Monday yeah. after the weekend, you're like, what did I do? I wasn't even there, you know, right. <laughs> stuff like that. So I totally feel you. And so, you know, and that's definitely an area I always like to, to dive into is like, what were, you know, what was that hard part, that really challenging part yeah. of, of that time in your life? And so it sounds like, you know, just seeing how mean girls can be especially yeah. in the middle school years, which can be quite, but it's just awkward. You're just like awkward at that time. You're going through yeah. like body changes. That's usually yeah. when we start our period. Like, yeah. oh my gosh, it's crazy. And so, you know, is that, because you talked about like, you know, your, inner, your mean girl, like your inner mean girl. Um, is that where, like, where you think it stemmed from? Like having that experience when you were young and knowing what well, that feels like to have your friends turn on you? Yeah, well, I mean, I think that it's like, really getting that that kind of stuff, like that's normal adolescence, Mm -hmm. right? And getting that if we can somehow find a way for our um, our girls and our boys too, by the way, Mm -hmm. but for us to give our kids the tools to tune into their inner wisdom Mm -hmm. from a young age, whether it's making choices about what's going on in junior high or middle school, or it's about going to that party and someone's getting in a car and they're at the wheel and they've been drinking or what have you. Mm -hmm. It's like, if we can give our kids the tools to tune into that inner wisdom and be in attunement with that, Mm -hmm. they hopefully will then be able to make more gutsy and courageous decisions Mm -hmm. about that. And so I feel like at that time, because even when I went to school Mm -hmm. and there was so much chaos and it was so hard and I was so devastated and you know, I'm such an emotional being. 
I'm an emotional creature. My daughters are the same way. They're incredibly emotional. They're incredibly attuned. I was definitely one of those kids where when there was a kid getting picked on in the playground, I'd like, I remember there's this one little boy that would constantly be getting kicked, picked on. And I remember when I finally got to be the team captain for dodgeball and I picked <laughs> him first, you know, I was like that kid that always gets picked on. He, you, you're first, you know, and he was, like, you know, it was such a huge deal in fourth yeah. and fifth grade to get picked first, which they thank God stopped doing that in a lot of schools. Um, so cruel. But uh-huh. it's like to try to be like, I, I'm, I'm going to choose you. I'm going to give you this experience because I can feel how horrible your life is because right. every day you're getting picked on. Yes. You know, so I was definitely that kid that was like, okay, I want to like try to bring in anyone that has been getting picked on. And, mm-hmm. you know, and I think that a lot of people who are coaches and end up coaches, they were that person. They were the person that was the listener. They mm-hmm. were the ones that were holding space for people. I mean, all my conversations in high school, like my mom still thinks it's hilarious that I make a living talking to people and having deep conversations. She's saying, you've been doing this. Like I, she couldn't get me off the phone when I was 16 right. years old because, right. and I wasn't just talking about gossip. That's never yes. been my thing. It was like, right. I wanted to know what do you think happens after we die? And um, like, you know, like acting, you know, asking those big questions from a very, very, very young age mm-hmm. and really being fascinated by people's answers. Totally, totally. So yeah. you were doing this from the beginning and I love that, you know, you had this empathy and you could feel people and and you were kind and you you saw them. You were like, I'm going to choose you. you. You made me remember when I was, what I used to do in high school is I would go to these parties and all, fights would always break out at every single one of these parties. Like I grew up in this small town yeah. in Florida yeah. I look back, I'm like, we just so bored that let's just fight, you know? And, and I hate fights. Like to this day when my kids fight, I'm like, you gotta stop. I'm like the fight breaker upper. And yeah. I was the fight breaker upper then. And yeah. usually it was like two brothers who were fighting or like cousins or they're like best friends like guys. And just, you know, keg beer was involved and they would be fighting cause like somebody knocked over somebody else's beer cup or something. And I would be like, this is ridiculous. You know, I'm, yeah. like, I'm like, you have to stop. I'm like, yeah. in the I'm like little me, you know, I'm like, yeah. Ah. So I was that person coming in being like, no, (laughs) you, you are not really wanting to do this. This is a mistake because I don't like to see people being mean to each other. Right. It's like, that's my thing is like the mean girls, like this is stupid. Like, it's just not a good use of energy. And, you know, so you made me remember that as you talked about what you, you, what you did as young girls, yeah. it sounds like you had a really, you know, happy childhood and it, but yet you still had these hard, hard experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think even when you're being raised in the, in the happiest home on mm-hmm. the planet, which of course, like, don't get me wrong. There's total dysfunction in my family. <laughs> Everyone there's has their stuff. stuff that goes down. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's just the human experience. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, and certainly, um, my mom in particular went through a really dark period with some pretty deep depression when I was a little kid. Okay. That was really scary and really hard. Wow. And I felt really responsible and I just mm-hmm. wanted to help as much as I could. Wow. You know, fortunately, she was so smart mm-hmm. at that time when, you know, therapy wasn't all that popular where she went and got help wow. and, and discovered the root of it and did all of this amazing work. So I had this, and my dad leaned into that. Oh, during good. a time when a lot of women and were, were doing this, this work on themselves and had husbands that did not like it. Right. They, they felt threatened. like threatens, like something's yeah. wrong with me or you're going to leave yeah. me or, uh, uh-huh. yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. And fortunately my dad, who is, you know, just one of the best people I've ever met in the world, he's amazing, mm-hmm. leaned in and supported my mom so beautifully while wow. she was doing that personal work and joined her and did his own personal work. And then, you know, we went to family therapy for a little while there to try to support my mom. And I remember actually, it's interesting. I haven't thought about this for a really long time, but I must've been like eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. We went to a therapy family session and I just sobbed the entire session, just sobbing and sobbing. And the therapist is like, why are you crying? And I'm like, I'm afraid they're going to get divorced because I had so many friends whose parents were getting divorced, right, which right. was so not what we were in therapy about. Like, right. That's not right. Actually you know, what was happening. You don't know. Mm-hmm. But I remember the therapist saying at the end of the session, I think everyone in this family could really take a cue from Amy mm. and to see how vulnerable Amy is being and wow. to really get that Amy is expressing the emotion, not just of herself, but of the entire family system. And so we really need to acknowledge Amy for that and really get to follow her lead on feeling all your feelings. And so I was really acknowledged for being the feeler. 
And that was incredibly powerful for me to not be shamed, to not be told I'm too emotional, get over Mm -hmm. it, Amy, God, Amy, which was a little bit of how it was dealt with in my household because I was so emotional. (laughs) And instead to be really acknowledged for that so powerful. So thank God for that therapist. My God. Right. And your parents were so wise, like so intuitive and, you know, ahead of their time to say, you know what, we need to all be in this and let's hire an expert to support us through that, which, and you became an expert to support your people through transition and shifting, you know, rising as leaders and, and you were acknowledged and, and validated in that experience, which, you know, it sounds like it has set you up for, you know, what you're doing now. That's such a beautiful story. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. How did you, you know, like you, you found your way into college, I'm gathering, yeah. and did you know right away you were going to go into coaching? Like, did, was that a thing? Like, how did you no. find it? Yeah, I know, right? Well, it's funny because, you know, back in, you know, I graduated college in 1996, Mm -hmm. And so coaching was so new back then. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so new. And after college, I lived in Los Angeles and um, I was doing a lot of theater and a lot of acting. I have actually a degree in drama. And so I'm a classically trained actress. Um, And so I was doing a lot of Shakespeare and Greek tragedies and studying Meisner and, you know, all of these, um, any of you that are actors out there know what I'm mm-hmm. talking about. And so I was doing a lot of theater in LA and doing a lot of auditions for stuff. And I really got clear very early on, mm-hmm. this was my early 20s, that the industry of acting was going to chew me up and spit me out. That it mm-hmm. would have little to do with the artistry, mm-hmm. the training didn't really matter, mm-hmm. that it was, especially as a young woman in her 20s, mm-hmm. It was about what you look like. It was about, you know, and they were like, we can't figure out what to do with you because you're kind of the girl next door, but you're not pretty enough to be the the lead actress, but you're not character enough to be the funny neighbor, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> whatever. So it was totally. like a lot of rejection and a lot totally. of like, like trying to fit me into this thing and whatever. Mm-hmm. And then I met this life coach. And again, this was like in the, in like 98, like 97, 98, when nobody knew it. I was like, what the hell's a life coach? And I encountered her and I ran into her three times in like a three month period in Los Angeles, which is really hard to do. I mean, it's like, oh, wait, oh, you, you know? So the third time I finally said to her, I was like, Melissa, I think I'm supposed to work with you, but I'm kind of a broke actor and I don't really know what that is or whatever. And so we came to this arrangement where she hired me to be her assistant in exchange for me receiving coaching. Ooh. She needed an assistant at that time. Mm-hmm. And through doing a lot of like the values clarification work, I was like, mm-hmm. there is like none of my values are going to be met in the world of acting. Got it. It's just not like, no wonder I'm so miserable. And she really mentored me into coaching. She said, you know, when we're at workshops and you're assisting me and you speak, everyone turns and listens. You make such a difference in the room. She really, truly mentored me into coaching. And so I went to the Coaches Training Institute um, because, of course, your certification program was not around at that time, back in 2099. And I went went to um, the Coaches Training Institute, CTI, and I took their first introductory course And I literally felt like the skies opened and the angels sang. And I was like, I found my calling. This is it. This is what I'm born to do. This is what I've been doing my whole life. And I never looked back. Like there's a lot of, I feel like artists that kind of gave up on their artist dream. And it's always been this longing. I cannot tell you, Jenny, uh, none of it. I don't have any of it. It's so interesting. But I feel like all of that training prepared me to be a coach because I love being on stages. I love doing interviews like this. I love having my own podcast. I love, you know, being on TV, like all of the training that I had has come into beautiful use as a coach. I've never looked at I love it. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's so in alignment. You're so good at what you do. And now I know that your drama background, I'm like, oh my God, oh my God. Um, That story was so amazing. And now I know the whole, the whole drama background again, because I've known you for a while now. We're getting to know each other because we support each other in, you know, in our work. But now that I know that, I'm like, well, no wonder you're freaking good at what you do. And I, your story of how you found coaching 
is similar to mine. You know, it yeah. wasn't like the exact same thing, but that whole feeling of like, once you find it, you're like, oh my God, like yeah. this is where I'm meant to be. This is my thing. The whole yeah. like talking on the phone to your friends and like I mean, yeah. wanting to have like, I think a common link between coaches who are really in it for the long haul and not just because it looks fun and you can have some like pretty pictures on, on Instagram and so, you know, Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> It's like a desire to really, like, really understand the human condition and, you know, really have deep, meaningful conversations with people that we care about and that we're really committed to. And I yes. just love that, like, that's a piece of your, your background and, and, and you have staying power because you have been here for, you know, 17 plus years. So yeah. talk about some of those, you know, earlier years in coaching, like, what yeah. was it like back then? Yeah, I know, right? <laughs> What were you doing? Well, I, you know, I want to say one thing because I love that you just said this yeah. about like the human condition and what have you. I realized that for me, the thing that I loved the most about acting was really being able to, and this is why in the actual Hollywood, especially, mm -hmm. it was like, oh gosh, this is not what's happening at all. But it was like really being able to look at a character and understand what motivates them. Mm -hmm. And like take off your own outer shell and put on the shell of a new character and find the truth of that character uh, and be able to express the truth of that character. Mm -hmm. That was fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And you know, like when you're really an actor's actor, right? Like you really study these different tools and trying to like create this whole backstory for this character. I mean, I remember one time I was in this play where I had no lines in this one particular role for this nun, like I was playing a nun that was scrubbing a floor when uh -huh. someone came in. And then the person asked and I was like a silent nun. And I created Jenny, I mean, pages and pages <laughs> of what was going on for this woman and like this nun and why she became a nun and what was happening for her, whatever. And I can't tell you, like, people were like, wow, that nun was really amazing. And I was on stage for, like, five seconds. But it was like I had a whole backstory, you know. Well, you did the work. Like, yeah. Like, yeah. You know, mm -hmm. I did my work, and I loved it so much. So mm -hmm. then when I became a coach, it was like, now I get to, like, sit across from a person mm -hmm. and really get into what's their story. Yeah. And if they want different results in their life, yes. what's the new story that they need to be claiming? Who is it that they need to become in order to create what they want in their life? Yeah. And so I just, I just think this, it's so fascinating. So yeah, it has real staying power for sure when you really love human beings mm. and when you, when you can really have compassion for human beings. And so when I first started coaching, you know, I, I took my first coach uh, coaching course at like the end of 1999. I went, I started, uh, you know, doing the full study and became a certified coach at CTI, you know, back in 2000, I had my first, very first coaching clients. Uh -huh. And one of the things I will say is that nobody knew what the hell a life coach was. Right. Different so time. when you were saying like, Oh, I'm a life coach. No, I mean, and still, let's be clear, like in our world and in our circles, everybody knows what a life coach is, mm -hmm. but not really in the majority of the world. Like right. you still need to really understand how to explain it and mm -hmm. how to really connect with people so that they understand. Because a lot of people will be like, well, isn't that what a friend is? It's like, yeah. no, your friend has a total agenda with you. Yes. <laughs> There's so many opinions about what yes. you should be doing, whereas a coach is just there for you. It's so yes. different, you know? So back then, it really was about explaining it thoroughly, being able to spread the word. Like there was almost this sense, mm -hmm. those of us in those early days, and, and my, my, the coach that mentored me had gotten into it like seven years prior than that. Mm -hmm. So she's been coaching now for like 24 years. Wow. And so you can imagine for her the evolution. Oh. But it was like in the beginning, it was like really being the pioneers, the trailblazers mm -hmm. that weren't just trying to create the revenue and the income and the livelihood for themselves, but we're really a stand for getting the word out about coaching and what it was really about. Mm, well, cool. thank you for doing it, you know, for doing that work, being one of the, yeah. the mavericks and, and realizing the potential of this line mm -hmm. of work. And I love what you said about that you love human beings. And I think that's, that's so, I haven't really thought about it in, in those words before, but that's what it is. Like when you just, you love people, you see their potential, you see, how they get in their own way, us included. Yes. Like we're not immune. Like we get in our uh -huh. own way too. And oh yeah. We just see like, we, you know, with, with some support and the right structure and you know, th that so much is possible. 
and you know you are on the, the cutting edge of that. And so, you know, where does your work stand now? I mean, I'm sure it's evolved quite a bit. It sounds oh, like, right? and just the vehicles that you use. It's like I remember. Yeah. I mean, I got into coaching in 2008, and so yeah. I, you know you know, after you. And back then I still laugh. I was like, do you remember teleclasses? I'm like, you know, teleclasses yeah. seemed like so wow. And I mean, do, I'm sure some yeah. people still do teleclasses, but you know, it, it's evolved. It's, I'm like the webinar is the new, is the old teleclass, but it's really just about yeah. that connection with people and, you know, letting them know that, that support is available and that what they want, they can truly have, but they, it's best not to do it on your own. So where do you like to hunker down now with the work? Like what gets you super jazzed in, in the coaching work that you do with your people? Mm -hmm. Great question. Yeah. I mean, it has evolved so much because like most coaches, you know, I started out with a very small private practice and it was like sending out an email with my hands trembling, like, okay, I'm coming out as a coach, you know, and sending it out to every person that I'd ever met, you know, ex-boyfriends and you know, but ex bosses and exactly. friends and family and anyone with cousin, a like fourth cousin and sending like, this to you. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. making your Outlook contacts yeah. field and like importing it in and be like, okay, BCC all these people and be yes. like, I'm coach now and I'm charging yes. $25 a month to talk to me four times a month. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Yes. <laughs> you know? And, you know, of course, at that time I had a different job um, so that I could afford to pay for my coaching tuition. And, mm. you know, I always call it the bridge job, right? I had yes. this bridge job into the world of coaching. And, um, and then, you know, after coaching for a certain number of years, really like in 2006, 2007, maybe even 2005, I started writing my first book, Mm -hmm. big fat lies women tell themselves, because I really noticed this pattern inside the head of all of my clients, not just women, but in particular women Mm -hmm. that were really believing lies about themselves, Mm -hmm. really looking at things like I'm a failure or I'm not enough or Mm -hmm. I'm too fat, thin, short, tall, or whatever it was, really noticing that there was these brutal lies that we were believing. And when they were able to get in touch with the truth Mm -hmm. of their own brilliance and magnificence, Mm -hmm you know, that their lives changed. And so I began writing my first book and, Mm -hmm. you know, up until that point, I had a a private practice. Um, My mentor coach, Melissa, we actually went into business together um, and we were also doing some corporate coaching and working at like law firms and some smaller companies in Los Angeles. And then when I wrote my first book, I wrote the entire thing before I knew anything about a book proposal because I knew nothing about that world. And I was lucky enough to get an agent Um, And then I worked on the book proposal and so on and so forth. And then basically was told, well, you don't have a quote unquote platform. And I was like, what the hell's a platform? Which basically is just, you know, you don't have an audience. You don't have a community of people that will buy this book. And so I was like, well, I want to build an audience. I want to build a platform. And that's when I really like up until that point, I had a website, but that was just really an online brochure. Right for my services and for, uh, you know, Melissa and I services at that time and that company. Mm -hmm. And so I really became, became determined Mm -hmm. back in 2008 Mm -hmm. to create an online world for myself. Mm -hmm. And so wake up call coaching, which is my current company, Mm -hmm. uh, was born in January of 2009. I became known as the wake up call coach and I began blogging. I began doing videos. I began Um, a a series called the women masters teleseminar series, because yes, we were doing teleseminars, right? So that series launched everything for me in terms of expanding my reach and being able to impact more beloveds Mm -hmm. and be able to reach more people. And I began this, um, you know, women masters series and I invited, like I literally looked at my bookshelf and I was like, okay, who would I love to have a conversation with? Yes. And I, wrote, like filled out the contact form on their website. (laughs) It was like, would you like to do this series? Which was very novel back then, right? Nobody was doing them. There was a few around Uh and, um, people said yes. And I ended up scoring amazing people on that summit. People like Sark and Marcy Shimoff and Lisa Nichols. And, and then I even got Marianne Williamson and that to me, who, who ended up reaching out to me, it's a whole Woo! other story. Yeah. Love and, 
and you know, so that really started my online world, mm -hmm. building a community. And then that really eventually led to my book deal. And my first book came out in 2011. And then my second So you sat on it and then the book deal came. It came. The you didn't self-publish. Probably wasn't so happening so much back yeah, I did not self-publish. I got all the rejection letters, uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> started building, also became a you mom during that time. Right, you're like, fine, I'll go build this platform then. I'll see you soon. Yeah, and yeah. then I went <laughs> back and I, I also hired a book proposal coach. Uh -huh. I redid the book proposal. We went back out and I ended up with three offers for that. Oh book. my gosh, that's so cool. And so how many books do you have out now? I have two books out. So my mm -hmm. first is Big Fat Lies, Women Tell mm -hmm. Themselves, mm -hmm. which was published in 2011. Mm -hmm. And that book is really a lie by lie guide. So it's 59 it. big fat lies ranging mm -hmm. from lies about self-worth and money and mm -hmm. physical appearance and spirituality. And then every lie has a corresponding truth. Nice. A coaching exercise that people can take themselves through mm -hmm. and an affirmation and an inspiring quote. So it's really mm -hmm bite-sized little pieces Has everything in there that they need yes exactly and it's fun like some people would use it as an oracle where they you know they take the book oh. and they'd be like oh what's the lie and then other people will look through the table of contents and be like oh that's the lie i'm believing and then go do the exercise with it oh my so it's God. a really fun book um and then i published my second book in 2015 called Reform Your Inner Mean Girl, which is based on the program Inner Mean Girl Reform School that I started mm -hmm. in 2010 mm -hmm. with my friend Christina Rilo, amazing coach. Mm -hmm. And we um, did that particular program, Inner Mean Girl Reform School, for years and then ended up scoring an amazing book deal through Simon & Schuster's Beyond Words division. And um, that book came out in 2015. So... Wow. It's amazing to be, you know, we got to do the audio version of that book, which is really fun too. Oh wow. And, um, it's a, it's that, that particular book is obviously in the same vein. I always like to say my books are love letters to women that are hard on themselves. <laughs> and, like um, reform your inner mean girl is really a step-by-step -step process for mm. turning down the volume on your inner mean girl mm. and our program inner mean girl reform school um, is still out in the world. It's an amazing program. It's really one of the flagship things. I'm so proud of it. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, hundreds of women have taken that program. And is that something that are you, do you own that now? Did you and her split that? Like how, how do you do that? Cause when you work with a partner and then, you know, then yeah. you maybe end yeah, that. And, yeah. Like how do you yeah. work through that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So with Intermingo Reform School, the thing that's so great is we evergreened the content. So we have this gorgeous mm -hmm. back end mm -hmm. entire system. We have this great system where mm -hmm. people don't log in for a while. It sends them a nudge email. Like it's really oh, cool. cool. Mm -hmm. And so we, um, both Christine and I co-own that together and uh -huh. she can market it whatever way she wants to. I can market it whatever way I want to. It runs through our separate shopping carts and just the people that I bring in, I receive and the people that she brings in, she receives Nice. And, and we, and when you, when you purchase Intermingo Reform School, you get a copy of our book. So that cool. benefits both of us, which is Oh my really gosh. Cool. And then, oh, that's cool. I like, I like to learn like a technical piece. So when somebody purchases, yeah. like, how is that book then sent to them? Do you like. So yeah. our team gets tagged, uh -huh. um, it gets the notification through Infusionsoft uh -huh. yep. in the book and then the book gets sent. And we and actually do it through, we fulfill through Amazon. Yeah. So you just like, we'll just go right in and we're like, just send, just yep. send them that the team, book. The team yeah. handles it. And uh -huh. it's great because it means that if Christine has a month where she sells a whole bunch of intermingle reform schools, she gets compensated for that. She did all yes. the marketing and yes. all of that, but I still benefit because every single one of those people is receiving a copy of the book that I co-wrote. Right. Of course we split the royalties on that. Yes. And it's good for both of us in the publishing world as well to keep that uh, book Right. Exactly. Oh, I like that. I like to kind of understand, like, tell me more of the backstory of that because yeah. you know, a lot of our listeners will consider going into partnerships or, you know, doing like a, you know, a joint program or something like that. Yeah. Just to kind of show like, here's what's possible, how you can handle it. And here's how it can, you know, still be paying dividends to you down the line. Cause it's really a core part of your work. That's really awesome. Yeah, And one of the things I would say is that if you're planning to collaborate with someone on a specific project, get everything in writing in yes. advance yes. and talk through, okay, here's what we're going to do. Here's the workload. Cause you'll both be like, okay, let's both market the living daylights out of it. And then mm -hmm. for one person that means putting it in their newsletter twice. And for the other person that means sending out 10 solo blasts 
and, and putting it all over social media. I've been right. there. I've done so many collaborations. Got it. And, you know, Find Your Calling I did with Martha Beck and Lisa Rankin. Um, I'm right now running a, a mastermind called the Radiant um, Radiance Mastermind and Prosperity uh-huh. Circle uh-huh. with my amazing friend Shiloh Sophia. So uh-huh. I have that collaboration. I did Visionary uh-huh. Ignition Switch with Lisa Rankin. Um, obviously, Intermingle Reform School with Christina Rilo. I am such an extrovert, and I love collaborating. Got so it. I've learned a lot of things the hard way. <laughs> you are the expert on that. Yeah. I really am. And what I will tell you is you have to get everything in writing in advance, and you have to put in there what's going to happen if one person wants to keep marketing it and the other person doesn't. Right. Is it just then that the, that both need to be in agreement? Mm-hmm. You want to have those discussions in the beginning when everything is great. Right. <laughs> you know, do your prenup, do your business. That's what I'm saying. Like, this is like a prenuptial, like what's going to happen yeah. with this scenario, that scenario, yes. that scenario, That's right. everything is good and you like each other. <laughs> That's exactly right. That's exactly right. And it can be so beautiful. And uh-huh. for me, when I, you know, I'm, I'm in an amazing marriage with my husband, Rob, we've been together almost 18 years now. I adore him. We have a very drama free marriage, which is Mm -hmm. so amazing. Mm -hmm. And I feel like in my business partnerships with other women has been the place where the most drama and the most growth edges as a human being have been realized for me. Uh It's been a wild journey and a wild path. I've learned so much about my own bullshit and my own inner mean girls and patterns and toxic things that I do that poison relationships and toxic things they do that poison, right? Uh Like it has been such a fertile ground for me in my own spiritual and personal growth. Oh (laughs) yeah. Oh yeah. This whole entrepreneurship thing. I know, you know, I, I had like this kind of joint partnership thing I did early on when I was like a baby coach and it was not a positive experience. And I think it kind of just like soured me. I was just like, never again. And, um, not to say that that is the correct approach, yeah. but I yeah. remember just being like, yeah, no. And you know, it was again, but a lot of lessons learned and like, I absolutely agree with you. Get things in writing. It seems, it always seems awesome at the beginning. <laughs> always. <laughs> yeah. If you're meant to, you know, you think you're meant to collaborate. It's always seems really awesome. And then shit comes out and you're just like, what? Yeah. <laughs> and so you do, you need to, and that, and that worked in our favor because we had that in Great. writing. And it was just, it was a great learning experience for me. And I, you know, what I, where I am in my business, I just, I love being able to like collaborate and, and, and have, you know, real conversations with colleagues. And like, right. that's where I am today. And I think part of my work is learning how to, you know, ask for help and like trust people and trust girls, you know, trust women like you, yeah. you know, background of, you know, mean girls. And I think some of the, even though it's like, we're celebrating kind of the fall of the patriarchy and some men who have been really, horrible to women, sometimes the most horrible people to women are other women, you know, other girls. And so, you know, totally. what we get to do in our business kind of plays all this stuff out for us. So whatever lessons we're meant to learn, we got to learn them. And you got to make sure you just have you, I absolutely like kind of everything. Like I just talked to a client recently and she was like, Oh, we've worked together for like 10 plus years. You know, we don't need to have this a contract. I'm like, yes, you do. You need to have an agreement. You just do. The universe is just saying to you, you know, you're going to get tested on this. So get it down in writing. Yeah. Oh my gosh, Amy. So where can people find more about you and your work and just all the great things that you offer? Oh, thank you, darling. Yeah. So you can check me out at wakeupcallcoach.com and on my site, wakeupcallcoach.com, you'll see a free gift called the wake up your inner wisdom kit five tools to help you to stop being so hard on yourself. So that's a fun little gifty that I have for you there. And you can find out about my podcast and all that good stuff right there. That's kind of the hub for me. And since we talked a little bit about the inner mean girls, I'll also say that Christine and I developed this really cool quiz called the inner mean girl archetype quiz, because Mm -hmm. In our work at Intermingle Reform School and in our book, Reform Your Inner Mean Girl, Mm -hmm. we really uncovered and discovered 13 different archetypes of inner mean girls. Mm -hmm. Because when we think of like, okay, self-bullying and being mean to ourselves, we usually think of like the overt meanness. But a lot of inner mean girls can be really sneaky, like the good girl inner mean girl archetype or the achievement junkie inner mean girl archetype who's all about you achieving and achieving and achieving no matter what it's costing you in every other area of your life. 
So that Inner Mean Girl Archetype Quiz is free. You can go to freeinnermeangirlquiz.com and it will um, give you an entire report along with instant deactivator tools mm-hmm. and invite you to one of my upcoming webinars and all that good stuff. So you can check that out at freeinnermeangirlquiz.com. Would love to have people check that out. Oh my, I love it. I love like it's the fun. deactivators. I'm like, I feel like I'm in this super wonder woman thing. I'm like, yeah, we got to deactivate. And I just, I love it. And it's a good URL, you know, like the marketer. I'm like, Oh, that's a very good URL. Do you do that? And I was like, that is a really good. Oh yeah. URL. Oh yeah. You know, I'm like, that's oh, yeah. Hell yeah. So like when you look for one and you're like, Oh my God, it's available. Are you kidding? I know. Like, <laughs> it's we so can, yeah, I know. Yeah. Shiloh and I always talk about okay, how much money we're spending on URLs we're not using. We're like, yo, I, I know, but I, I had to buy a it. phase. I went through a phase, <laughs> and then I, I've kind of come to the other side of that phase. But I have, I have some certain URLs. I'm like, those are gold. Those are like yes. golden URLs, and that's a very good one. All yes. right, girl. Oh my goodness, I love this conversation. I want to know. I want to know your gutsiest move, Amy. What is the gutsiest move you've ever made and how does it inspire your life and work today? You know, it's interesting because the first thing that comes up when you say that, that, because of course, you know, it's gutsy to become a coach. It's gutsy to leave. Like I had a cush six figure sales gig where I was making a whole bunch of money and barely working. And I left that for the coaching world and become an entrepreneur and Uh all of that stuff. But the thing that's coming into my heart when you say that is, you know, I, I, so my daughters are six and a half years apart. Mm-hmm. And after I had my first baby, Annabella, um, I wasn't sure if I wanted more kids. And then as time went on, I was like, oh my gosh, I totally want to have another kid. I want to give this child a sibling and all that mm-hmm. jazz. Mm-hmm. And so then we were really struggling. We really struggled getting pregnant for the second time. Mm-hmm. And as I went in and listened to my inner wisdom, Mm-hmm. And I hired a coach, an amazing coach that I'm um, named Elizabeth Manning, who does coaching that's called Fertile Living, and she does conscious conception conception coaching. Yeah, and, um, yeah, just she's amazing. And as I started doing work to call this baby in, and I was approaching forty at the time, mm-hmm. and I really kind of had in my mind, you know what? If I'm not, I, I was clear that I didn't want to do fertil- traditional fertility treatments. That that was not a good match for me. And because I already had a baby, like I was already a mom. Yeah. I was, I'm, I'm not going to go that route. Mm-hmm. And I'm willing to do acupuncture and do alternative therapies. Right. But what I got really clear about was as I went within and listened to my inner wisdom that I actually didn't have enough space for this baby to come through. Mm. That I was so busy as a working mom and my business was really growing at that time. And, you know, it had hit kind of the, the, spike of three quarters of a million dollars. And I was on my way to seven figures and all this stuff. And I was working a lot and just energetically really holding a lot. Mm -hmm. And so, and then I had a lot of people around me that were hitting New York times bestseller list and all of this stuff and like growing and expanding, expanding, expanding. And I really got that if I wanted to bring this baby in Mm -hmm. that I needed to actually slow down and create space for what ended up being her. Mm-hmm. And that to me was so gutsy mm-hmm. because it was like, okay, I'm going to slow down the pace. I'm going to slow down the expansion. I'm going to allow a little contraction inside my business. I'm going to make less money. Mm-hmm. I'm going to really go into self-care on a new level. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, I might not get the baby. And it felt so gutsy. Yeah. To be like, okay. And I was like, okay, if by my 40th birthday, if I'm not pregnant, I'm going to release it. And then I'm going to go balls to the wall on my business as the expression goes, you know, and I'll just be like, all right, right on. you know, and it was really scary because mm-hmm. it's not like, you know, so often in life, you know, you think, okay, well, if I do X, Y, Z, then I'm going to receive the benefit of it. But with pregnancy, right. you don't know. Mm-hmm. And so I slowed everything down and I had all of these people speeding up around me and I started really cocooning and slowing down. And then I'm happy to say that on my 40th birthday, I threw a huge 40th birthday party. My husband's a musician and his band played amazing music. And I was in this hot red dress, super pregnant. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I got that at the end, and it, but could have gone the other way. 
And right. I really, and here's the other gutsy thing I did uh-huh. Uh-huh. as I said, okay, I'm going to slow down and I'm not going to let not being pregnant hold my happiness pot hostage any longer. Right. Right. Wasn't going to steal your joy. Mm-hmm. That's right. And I was like, I'm going to have an amazing life, even if yes. I don't have a second baby. Right. And I'm going to do these things because that's what my inner wisdom is guiding me to do. Right. And if at the end of the day, I end up with the baby in my arms, the second baby. Mm-hmm. And thank God I did. I mean, Evie Rose, my second, mm-hmm. is now three and a half. She's just, oh my gosh, she's so delicious. Totally. <laughs> totally. I've got my three and a half year old too. And it's like, Oh my gosh, but what a story that you were willing to do that, which for those of us who are ambitious women, we're so many things we want to do and people want to help and we're so good at it. And, and it is, it's like, you know, I look at it as like pacing myself. Yeah. I come a lot back to, you know, the season that I'm in, the cycle yes. that I'm in. Yes. Stressing that. And there is really a season that we can bear children for those of us who have been blessed if that's what we want to do. We can't, I mean, it's not, we can't do it when we're 70, you know? And so it's like, but there's, and I have to remind myself of that. I'm like, I've got a long time to do this. There's things that I want to put out now. There's people that I want to help. And, you know, I want to be there with my kids too. I don't want to work around the clock. I I just, but I I do, I I still to this day have to like rein myself in at times. You know, I'm sure you, you have that still too. For sure. Like, Oh yeah. Slow your roll, girl. Slow your roll. Yeah. yeah, that's right. Well, and really looking at, you know, as you own your own business, and for those of you that are coaches or entrepreneurs, there's years that are about expansion and there's years that are about contraction. And that mm. doesn't mean that you screwed up or that you're a loser or that your business is going down. I mean, I think that it's like when you look at the general curve of your business, you're hoping that it's it's growing in certain right. ways. And right. That, like, revenue is just one metric, by the way. Good point. But it's like, you know, creativity is another huge metric. Feeling fulfillment is, is the most, in my mind, the most important metric in our work. But it's mm-hmm. like, there's years where it's like going more ex- and expanding and expanding. And then there's also years of like solidifying, yeah. you know, there can be years in your business where you're like, okay, we need to work on team and structure here. This is not about launching new programs. This is not about doing new things. This mm-hmm. is about solidifying some systems and structure so that mm-hmm. everyone's not running around like a crazy person. Yes. Oh my God. Oh my God, girl, no. you have so much wisdom and you've just, you've been here for a while. I'm like, <laughs> you're like, you know, the senior and you know, maybe I'm like a junior or something like that. <laughs> In like the coaching landscape. Right, right, right. I think I'm a junior. I think I'm a junior to your senior. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And then there's people with PhDs out there. Let's be clear, you know. <laughs> oh, <laughs> right. on their shoulders. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. Exactly. And, and it's just, it's fun to have these conversations and have these reminders. And oh my gosh, what a story. And I'm so glad that you got your daughter. When's her birthday? Your three and a half. March years. 5th. Okay. All right. So she's, uh, Kate is April 16th. So oh, yeah, they're, they're yeah. So, oh my gosh, we have to yes. get them together, Jenny. I know, that would be really oh fun. They that are like, so yeah, we had to pause this interview at one point because my daughter was at the door like, <laughs> ah. and no, and I just like, that's my whole thing too is, you know, things sometimes are messy and it's just like, you know what, this is real life. And I, I like to be able to talk about that because I think some people don't feel like they can start because like my life is really messy right now. I'm a hot mess. I had somebody recently, she was like, oh, I can't be a coach because I'm like, a, I'm a hot mess. I'm like, girl. Hot messes make the best coaches. <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, and it's like, you know, please, let's not say that you can only be a coach or a therapist or a teacher or whatever if you have everything together because then nobody gets to be one. <laughs> nobody. Like, we're screwed. Nobody no gets one. to be one. Exactly. But I think it's so important, too, to come from that space of, like I always say to my students and my clients and my readers, like I'm qualified to coach women that are hard on themselves because I'm hard on myself. Yes. <laughs> Not because I have it all figured out, but I've had to develop tools for my yes. own beauty, you know? Yes. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. This has been wonderful. Thanks for hanging out with me. We went longer than I normally do, but we just were on that roll and you know, it was rad. And I also feel a, a, a kin, a, you know, like a kinship. I think it's right. Do you yes. because my, my mother told me she wanted to name me Amy. And oh. so when I meet Amy's, I'm like, I could have been an Amy, but my maiden name is Eamon and she was wise. And my, my father, I'm sure was part of this, this decision too. They didn't want me to be named Amy Eamon. Little yeah. too close. The same. It's yes. like, you know, when you meet those people and you're like, 
you know, they were like, their name was like Tom Thompson. I'm like, you know, they didn't want me to have that. And so yeah, yeah, yeah. I, was, I became a Jennifer, but then I found my way to Jenny, you know, yes. seeing it with the Y. Cause I like the Y yes. ending. I really do. I like it. <laughs> I like it. I think that's great. Well, and I always say when I meet other Amy's, I've never met an Amy I didn't like. That's how I feel. Like I meet great Amy's and great that's Jenny's, nice. you know, great. Yeah, when I meet me a Jenny, it's like Jenny and Amy, there's a thing. There's yeah. a thing that I have. <laughs> and Julie, cause Julie was my sister. So the Julie's and I, like we go way deep. We go way deep. Oh my gosh, Amy. Thanks so much for being here. Everybody Thank go you, check out her stuff. We'll have all the links on our show notes page, jennyvenning.com. You can come there. Check out Amy's work. She's a just stellar. She just she knows what's up. She is a solid, solid coach. And I am so happy to have the opportunity to, you know, share this space with you and invite you in to get gutsy with all of our wonderful episodes and people and messages. So with that, I say this is Jenny Fennick sending you so much love, light, and faith as you get gutsy. I will see you next time. Hey, this is John Lee Dumas of EO Fire, and you're listening to Get Gutsy with Jenny Fennig. Gutsy leaders unite and ignite. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Get Gutsy as much as I enjoyed creating it for you. Are you responsible for leading and growing your spiritual business? If so, I have a free tool for you that will help you spread your message like wildfire. It's called the Sacred Marketing Puzzle, and it's a one-page PDF guide that simplifies the often mysterious and confusing world of marketing. When you use sacred marketing tools to amplify your message, you'll provide huge value to your tribe and grow your business. What are you waiting for? Go to jennyfennick.com slash puzzle to get yours instantly. That's jennyfennick.com slash puzzle. Gutsy leaders, unite.